on. Hi. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to the library, to the DC Public Foundation, to Loyalty Books, who is outside selling copies of Alejandro's amazing books, um, and to you all for showing up, because I think that's part of La Comunidad Reads, is getting to interact with you all, meet you all for the first time, or see returning faces um, and connecting over books. So thank you so much for being here, for taking the time to be here with us. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our star of the hour, Mr. Alejandro Valera. He is based in New York. His work has appeared in The Point Magazine, Boston Review, Harper's Magazine, The Rumpus, Joyland Magazine, and many other publications. He is a 2019 Jerome Fellow in Literature, and his graduate studies were in public health. Shout out to public health professionals real quick. Woo -woo. <laughs> His debut novel, The Town of Babylon, was published by Astra House in 2022 and was named a National Book Award finalist. Um, so please, round of applause. And Good? Okay. Hi. How are you? Don't answer that. Okay. Um, so thank you for having me, DC Public Library. Thank you, Lupita. Thank you, everyone who's here. Um, I'm going to read to you from one of the short stories. It'll be a very short part of the short story. Uh, it was published in Harper's a few years ago. I should warn, I should say that, uh, or disclaim that I have never worked at the United Nations. <laughs> but, but I'm still young, so it could happen. This is called Carlitos in Charge. I was in Midtown, sitting by a dry fountain, making a list of all the men I'd slept with since my last checkup, doctor's orders. Afterward, I would head downtown and wait for Quimby at the bar alongside the early drinkers. I'd just left the United Nations after a Friday morning session, likely my last. The agenda had included resolutions about a worldwide ban on plastic bags, condemnation of a Slobodan Milosevic statue, sanctions on Israel, and a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in El Salvador. Except for the proclamation opposing the war criminal's marble replica, everything was thwarted by the United States and a small contingent of its allies. None of this should have, should have surprised me. Some version of these outcomes had been repeating weekly since World War II. I'd been working at the United Nations for a little over a year, and in that short time, I'd had sex with the South Korean ambassador, the spokesman for the Swedish mission, an Irish delegate, a Russian interpreter, an Iraqi translator, the assistant to the deputy ambassador from El Salvador, an Armenian envoy, the chief of staff for the Ukrainian prime minister, the vice presidents of Suriname and the Gambia, a cultural attache from Poland, the special assistant to the special assistant to the Saudi ambassador, the nephew of the ruling party's general secretary of Laos, a distant cousin of Castro, a film director from Mauritania, countless low-level staffers, a few guides, a half dozen tourists, and Brad. <laughs> William Mycroft Quimby. The other students called him Billy. To me, he was Quimby, sometimes Quim, the PhD student who led my section of Comparative Government 245. Cuba isn't Finland, but neither is Finland Cuba. Quimby was a smart guy who came across as even smarter because his English was high register and thickly accented, and he was authentically Irish, unlike the third generation Catholics I'd grown up with, whose ethnic pride consisted of tattoos of shamrocks and pots of gold along their necks and ankles. In the phenotypical, in phenotypical ways, he reminded me of, sorry, in phenotypical ways, he reminded me of my friend's dad's back home. He had dark hair, also thick, and a knotted face. Quimby was an academic, but he could have been a middleweight boxer, a boxer who gave me attention I wasn't accustomed to. He also had a gorgeous, uncircumcised cock, it too thick, that made me want to know him better. But we drew the line at office hours. <laughs> I hadn't seen Quimby for almost 20 years when I ran into him at Whole Glory on Friday, about 15 months ago. The red bulb lighting made it difficult to be certain, but when he walked past the first time, I knew I knew him. The second time, I knew it was from college. The third time, a rush of blood inspirited me. Quim, I shouted. He stared at me momentarily, then a moment longer. Wednesday afternoons, I said. Your basement office, 
NAFTA, SHMAFTA, can you hear the world's laughter? Charles in charge, is that you? Holy shit, I barely recognized you with that mustache. How the heck are you? Before I could respond, Quimby set his pint down onto the small table and joined me. It's been ages, he said with a glassy stare. What a truly magnificent surprise, Charles in charge. Fine as ever you are. Carlitos is my given name. Carlitos Doritos, the other kids used to call me. One more undesirable way in which I stood out. In middle school, I began demanding that my family address me as Alex P. Keaton, but my dad kept mispronouncing it Alice, which my siblings seized upon, so I settled on Charles in Charge. This was the title of a sitcom that starred Scott Bayo as a young heartthrob who nannies three children while going to school and juggling a prolific love life. I was drawn to the show because of Charles's, Bayo's, relationship with his best friend Buddy, Willie Ames, and a one-dimensional, albeit oddly sagacious buffoon. Their camaraderie and affection were genuine and subtle in ways that none of their other acting ever was. The slapstick humor struck me as either repressed or coded desire. Frankly, I didn't understand how the show made it onto network television. Carlitos? Sister Susan, my sixth grade teacher, called out. But instead of present, I responded, Charles in charge. Is that Mexican, she asked, peering up from the attendant seat. No, I said, it's syndicated. <laughs> Are you visiting? I live in Brooklyn, near one of the bridges, Quimby explained, looking even more like the dads of my youth than he had 20 years earlier. I work for the Irish mission to the UN, he continued. I'm seeing someone, he's French, divides his time between here and Paris, filmmaker, how about you? I'm also in Brooklyn, I work at the health department, I'm single. I explained to Quimby that after college I'd taken a stab at an acting career. Some theater, a few clown parties, and a couple of television commercials. In fact, one toilet paper ad paid for all of graduate school. I studied public health, specifically the effects of hierarchies. Does pecking order predict health outcomes? Yes. Fascinating, he said, and reached across the table to squeeze my forearm. Quimby and I exchanged numbers and had sex once for old time's sake, a few weeks later. Afterward, he asked me if I was looking for a new job. The UN relies heavily on health data, he said. You could, you could find work rather easily. I wasn't unhappy at the health department, but I found the idea of the UN intriguing and romantic, like Juliette Binoche and Naveen Andrews in The English Patient. So I followed up. My official position was health researcher, category four, for the United Nations Human Rights Council, UNHRC. In brief, I was a summarizer tasked with taking complicated research and reducing it to talking points, bulleted lists, 14-point font. Vis-a-vis -vis the HRC, most of the nearly 200 member states wanted me to build a bulwark of data against my own country. Anything to get the United States to come to its senses was the popular sentiment throughout the UN. At first, I felt strange about working for the world and not my country like the orphan athletes who carry the nondescript flags at the opening ceremony of the Olympics. But Quimby explained that we had no choice. Convincing the US to do no harm is the full-time job of many, many people, he said. What did you think happened here? The truth was I hadn't given it much thought. Also true, it didn't matter. My questionable influence peddling didn't influence shit. In a short period of time, I learned that the United States was immune to easily interpretable, common sense data on everything. Pollution, tuberculosis, birth control, abortion, breastfeeding, war, rape, white phosphorus, blue phosphorus, red phosphorus, lithium, PTSD, GMOs, slavery, winged migration, lions, tigers, polar bears, grizzly bears, panda bears, capital punishment, corporal punishment, spanking, poverty, drug decriminalization, incarceration, labor unions, cooperative business structures, racist mascots, climate change, Puerto Rico, Yemen, Syria, Flint, Michigan, women, children, wheelchairs, factory farms, bees, whales, sharks, daylight savings, Roman numerals, centimeters, condoms, coal, cockfighting, horse betting, dog racing, doping, wealth redistribution, mass transit, the IMF, CIA, IDF, MI5, MI6, TNT, SNAP bracelets, Pez dispensers, Banksy. It didn't matter what it was. If the Human Rights Council or Cuba advocated one way, the United States went the other. I kept at, I kept at it anyway. This was, after all, what I was paid to do. And a few times, human rights did line up with US interests. 
AIDS initiatives, for example, were well funded as long as they didn't include mention of sex work, harm reduction, or anal. Also popular, eagles and pharmaceuticals. <coughs> oh, it's yours. Oh, okay. Yeah, mine works now. Okay. Yeah, we're good to go. Okay. I could have listened to you read all night, honestly. Like, I love, I love that you read that story specifically. I was talking to a couple of friends over here about whether or not I could pick a favorite, um, and I, I think I couldn't, but now I can after hearing you read that one because it's amazing. Um, and what I missed when I first started reading the book, I just dived in. I had no idea that you intended them to be interconnected short stories, mm. uh, and it was such a pleasant thing to come across as a reader. Did you always, from the very beginning, like how did that come about? Not at all, actually. I, I, I wrote them all individually. When you're a short story writer, for those of you who don't know, um, I didn't have an intention to, to write a collection. I had an intention to write short stories and have them published. And so each one was on its own. And I wasn't thinking about what was coming next or whether I would cover the same themes. The problem with that was that because I was revisiting so many of the same themes and protagonists, I, when it came time to put them together, I realized I had introduced many of the same things in different ways, but they were the same introduction. So then I, the, putting them all together, I actually had to excise some of the repetition, some of the characters, some of the ideas. And that was only after I couldn't sell the collection at all. Everyone wanted a novel because novels apparently sell better, I, they do. And, um, and so at first I was like, hmm, let me see. And I started kind of trying to push them all together. And I was like, maybe you can have lots of plots in one <laughs> novel. And, uh, and when I realized I was trying to force something that I wasn't interested in doing, I just went back and uh, tr treated them very like individually. But you're right, after a while I kept looking. I mean, there are 30 stories and only 13 made it into the book. So, you know, I started thinking, you know, two panic attack stories, fine, three are too many, you know. If in four of them I can't catch a cab, that's one thing, but five is like overkill. You know, like, they, so I started to remove things and, and then I ended up with these 13 and I couldn't ignore that there was a central couple, uh, Eduardo and Gus, and we sort of follow their relationship over the course of the book. And then I liked that in some ways it was an arc and an anchor, um, but it, uh, much like Gus is to Eduardo, it was also like a, just a backdrop, a safety net, really. And with that, I could explore all these other ideas. Yeah. And you said you initially had 30, so what was the editing process like that? Like in terms of just going down and caving through? Right. I mean, literally it was like, hmm, this one has a really intense moment of catharsis, and so do these three others. We can't have all of those in one collection. And so then it became easier. And I don't, it was really tough, because at first it was easy. I was like, I'll put all the ones that were published in, and then five others that weren't published. Because if they were published, that must mean they're good, and they've already been validated by the establishment, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, pat myself on the back, too many were published, and then they didn't want that many, because they said no one's going to buy them if they can find them individually in journals or online. So then it'd be, it, it started to get easier. And, uh, and then I thought, OK. Most of these are first, pers first person, but one of them is third person. No, no, I can't do that. I have to have at least three third person ones, and at least two, two, because I have one second person. So then it became like that, too. And then one of them was very experimental in form, and I was like, that looks gimmicky. So let me include the other two that are kind of also a little experimental. So it, that, was the, that was the calculus. My editor was like, nah, do all 30. And I was like, OK, <laughs> no, <laughs> the collected works yes. of. <laughs> I was, I I'm yeah. curious about those 30, though, the, like the, those ones that weren't. I mean, isn't, isn't anyone, right, yeah. curious about what wasn't, uh, what could have been? Are we going to see them anywhere anytime soon? Is, that too, is it too soon to ask that? No. I mean, they're in some of them. I continue to write short stories, and I think some of them I probably won't ever look at again because they're not good. And some of them I'll work on in a few years and maybe get them into better shape. But I also think I have enough sort of as a... This is very unromantic and businessy, but sort of a back pocket short story collection in case I need to get out of a contract I don't want to be in. <laughs> but I mean, I still, I, it's, I wouldn't put something out there that I wasn't 
happy or excited. I mean, I like the stuff that I'm putting out. I mean, yes, even if they're already published, I feel good about the work. But I have thought about that. I have all of these other stories, so maybe that'll be the, the fourth book or the fifth book. Right, wait, because you have two other books that you've recently sold, is that correct, that you have coming? Yeah, so... You're on fire. Yeah. And I'm excited, I mean, as a mm -hmm. reader who was like a huge fan, like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> no digas, like, we're yeah. here, we're ready, come on. Yeah, yeah and, you know, the, the first two books I sold completed manuscripts, right? I mean, the short story collection changed a little bit, but I gave them two completed manuscripts, and these two I sold on spec, which were just one-page descriptions. Wow. So it's a very different kind of writing process now, a different type of pressure. Um, but, you know, uh, but pressure is a privilege, I guess. It's fine. I'm, I'm not worried. Don't worry. I'll be fine. Oh, no. <laughs> We're not worried. We're ready. Oh, good. <laughs> is that pressure? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm actually, kidding. no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, you know what? I think that what I resonate with the most, and again, it was a shout out to the public health professionals, is your background in public health. Yeah. How did you make that transition from public health to writing? And, and a larger question, did you always envision weaving that into your background into your writing? Um, I still, in public health circles, say that I'm a public health worker and fiction is my medium. And, um, and I tried initially to sell this and to editors and to my agent as like, this is public health fiction, it's a whole new genre, trust me. <laughs> and they would all it say- should be. Right, but they would say, stop saying that. Uh, but, but you know what, the pandemic changed that a little bit. Yeah. Um, people like talking about public health now in every arena. And so that sort of opened the door a little bit for me. I can't help but talk about public health because it's the lens with which, mm -hmm. through which I view the world and all of our relationships and our history and our future. So when I'm writing, it, some, it, it kind of comes out naturally. They're the preoccupations that I have personally. And uh, my, narr my narrators tend to, be, uh, to live a lot of their time in their interiors. And so they preoc they're preoccupied with these things too. The balance is just finding a way to do all of that without lecturing people, yeah. you know? And, um, that's, I'm still learning how to do that, to be honest with you. And to, if you believe some of the, you know, Amazon <laughs> reviews, I haven't, I haven't fully learned how to do that yet. But, um, but, but yeah, I, th I find that the best way to do that is maybe what I, this excerpt is good for this question because it was a way for me to undercut the wonkiness and maybe a little bit of lecturing with humor and to be irreverent and to be sexy, I think that helps to take down the rest. But, but yeah, I can't not talk about public health and, and I find it impossible not to. And it sort of lends itself because public health generally is about changing health behaviors. Wear a seatbelt, floss, put on a condom, like these are all things, eat less sugar. This is how, how, this is how most of us receive public health in society, and um, I think the best interventions and the best public health work looks at the reasons why people do the things that they do, not just trying to change their behaviors, but understanding uh, where they came from, what their experiences are, and that is, in a way, what writing is anyway. In um, my fiction, and lots of, I think, writers do this, you really interrogate what is this protagonist doing? Like their actions are not happening in a vacuum. Where do they come from? What happened? And I have often said that um, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison is, is a perfect example of public health writing. And it influenced very much the novel, The Town of Babylon, um, the pink book. And she does this because she introduces what you would think for maybe for most readers is an irredeemable character who does so much damage and you just think there's no way that we can salvage this person and then next chapter we learn who he is and why he is. And that isn't to excuse behaviors, it's just to understand them so we don't keep making the same mistakes. And I think that's good public health work. So yeah, so that's how these things came together. Yeah, um, I mean, and I think about how you're also writing into like unexplored theories of public health, like the ways in which community is a buffer to stress Right. You know, to every to what we experience in terms of microaggression and racism, 
And that's something that I don't think that public health knows how to really figure out yet. Right. But you're writing into it, and so I'm curious about, about that. Um, thanks for bringing that up. I, that, is my, that is my soapbox, really, in all of my writing. There is no, there is no uh, better antidote to the stress of life than community. And that sounds really woo-woo, but I, I'm actually talking about like science, like measurable levels of cortisol in your body, which is the stress hormone, and, and social support, social capital, all these different ways of talking about it. If you feel a strong connection and you feel like you have people in your life, that's a buffer to that stress. And so it almost, that, that, that is so essential. The problem is that it conflicts with the world that we live in because of what capitalism is, right? It, um, y you have to sacrifice community in order to, to increase profits. There is no way around that. It's cheaper for people to be, in some ways, immediately for, you know, for corporations, for people to be unhealthy. In the long run, it isn't, but in the short run, it is. So then you don't really care too much about those long-term effects. Anyway, um, my point is that I try to write about the different ways in which people either are or aren't in community and highlight the effects on them. And has, have your characters ever taught you something new in which you, you know, didn't realize when you're navigating how, you know, the effects of being in community and possible pressures or, or not, or, you know, the benefits of it? My characters taught me anything. Hmm. You know, before I published any th or either of the books, I used to, you know, uh, go to see other writers talk or read articles about the writing process, and not too many. And I would hear people say, oh, so they grew so attached to this, this character that they wrote, and I thought, they're figments of your imagination. Like, what, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? Yeah, are you okay? And now I think I understand that, in the novel in particular, but I did grow attached to some of the characters, mostly because I spend time wondering, what are they up to, what could they be doing? which is a little self-serving because it's like sequel. But, uh, but yeah, just thinking about where they are. I, so I don't know if they've taught me. Maybe that in and of itself is a bit of a lesson to kind of be thinking about. My worst fear is it's a review would say that one of my protagonists is, is two-dimensional or is flat. That's my worst fear, that they're sitting there kind of taking up space or just representing a piece of society for the sake of representation, but there's no depth. Um, so I guess anything that makes me think about where are they, where are they going, where they come from, um, reminds me to 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 respect the protagonists because they are makes just makes them more believable and real for the reader. No, absolutely, and I think that's another thing that I'm really like a soup, when I talk about your work, I'm always like, no, but these characters are so nuanced and they're so incredibly complex and there's so many layers to them, mm. you know, um, and a balance of humor. Yeah. Right, um, and so I want to I want to touch on your, the humor and mm. and how you fold that in. And we were talking to a friend who also came in, and we're like, it's hard to be funny to transmit funny on a page, and you do that so well. So, Thank where you. did you take classes? Can yeah, <laughs> no, I'm a middle child, so um, and uh, and so I'm always looking for ways to get attention. And oh, that sounds so sad, <laughs> but it's true. And so I think I just kind of grew up <laughs> broke and a middle child, and I'm like, how do I get attention? And humor is a really good way to do that. Was that calculated? I don't think so. I think it was just like, oh, that worked. But that thing worked, so let me keep doing that. Um, and I said that thing earlier about undercutting some of the, the, the preaching and with humor or reverence. I wish I could say that it was like, oh, I just wrote this whole like list of things that, at the UN and now I have to be funny, but it's not like that. I think it comes out naturally. I also think I am an anxious person and so my narrators are anxious. And anxiety, if, you, <laughs> if it's wielded well, is actually quite funny. And so if you are, the, the, the very nature of thinking and overthinking something can be humorous. So the stars just sort of aligned. I'm taking all of my pathos and like <laughs> using them for good. I mean, I think that's one of the things that me and my wife, I made my wife read this because I was like, you're gonna love it. And she did love it, she's out there. Um, but one of the things that we talk a lot about is your, 
your ability to capture that spiraling that you do mm. when you experience like a microaggression, you're like, I could have said this, I should have done that. And all you said was like, nothing. You know, right, like, right, you're just like, right. okay, like, in, or, you know, you could have just said something better. And so yeah. I think that speaks to like that anxiety, neurotic, like narrative voice yeah. that kind of exists across the pages of this collection. Would you say that's right? Yeah, and I, I think I would also add that I, before, before people read my work, I assumed that I was unique in the, the degree of spiraling <laughs> that, I, that I do on a regular basis. I mean, I, you know, I've seen like Woody Allen on, you know, on the screen, so I know that people like this exist, but I really thought mine was quite unique. And the number of people who reach out to me on a regular basis who have read my work, they were like, oh my God, it's like you're in my head. Yeah. And I, the, the things that we have in common are a certain degree, I believe, of marginalization in society. Not always, but primarily. And I think that is because um, if you feel a bit of an, like an outsider or you feel like your voice doesn't matter, or if you speak up, it's gonna be horribly humiliating and you're gonna sound stupid. And, and that's how you were socialized, and, and this particularly your formative years, or, then you kind of are living in your head anyway. You're still participating, but no one knows it. And so I was absolutely the kid in school who did not raise their hand, and then someone would say exactly what I was gonna say, and the teacher was like, Brilliant, and I was like, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm exactly, or at least I was at some point, the person who would get the wrong food or like the overcooked thing or something, and I was like, I'll just keep that to myself, it's no big deal, I'll eat it. And, uh, and so I think, yeah, so you spend a lot of time redoing life, and, and you get good at it, and so you never think you're gonna have an opportunity to do it, and then pff, suddenly you have a writing career, and you're like, oh my God. I could do this for the rest of my life. I have 40 years worth of unfinished conversations and, <laughs> and moments in cabs where I'm like, oh, I should have said this, that, the other thing. And, um, and I think that, I mean, you all laugh. So it is funny. That I, very idea is funny. And so I'm definitely milking that. I always think um, it's the no worries. <laughs> you know, I'm great at the no worries, which right. is like, no, yeah. there yeah. is a worry. Right. but right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, and I also read in an interview that you mentioned before you were a middle child and <laughs> you, you struggle with the exposure that has been, that's come from first, you know, being a finalist for the National Book Award with The Town of Babylon, and now with this collection and your continual writing, how do you push through? Mm. Um, and, and I ask as a child of an immigrant who does struggle with that, like, I want to be seen and not, you know, I don't want to be seen and heard, but I also want to contribute because I feel like I have something to contribute. Right, and you do. Thank you, Lupita. Um, uh, two answers. Okay, one is beta blockers. Okay, took a pill before I started, and I feel great. Okay, and my doctor gave it to me, so it's okay. Uh, the other is practice. So I actually don't get anywhere near as nervous or uncomfortable as I used to. I used to take that same pill and still be up here being like, oh God, this is horrible, I can't believe it. They hate me, everyone's sticking with they're judging me. Now I don't care. I feel good, I feel good. Not that I don't care, I actually feel comfortable. So yeah, a lot of it is practice. And then just getting out of my head around, uh, this is gonna say, this has become a therapy session, but I, I think when I first started, every room that I walked into, I thought it's antagonistic. Like people are either waiting for a mess up or they're waiting to poke holes in my work. And some of that, I think, comes from all of the stuff in, you know, in your life, but also because my career is in public health. So it's a science, it's a social science. And you actually are getting torn down on a regular basis, and it's healthy because the goal is to, is to search for truth. And so if you're not getting it, and someone in the room realizes what you're doing wrong, it's okay for them to say, actually, no. But you know, bringing that to a space like this and writing sort of this sort of thing and that includes so much personal stuff or incorporating, maybe I was afraid that that degree, that kind of judgment wouldn't work well. Those, uh, those arenas would clash. But it hasn't been that way at all. I don't, there are very few people who take time out of their day and get a babysitter and come to a, a book reading or a talk on, on a, something I've written in order to like, they're waiting to take me down. That, 
Yeah, that hasn't happened very often. Um, but we haven't gotten to the Q&A yet, so who knows? Well, that's a good reminder. We will be doing an audience Q&A, and I know last time we got caught up, and I didn't leave you guys enough time to ask questions. So I won't, I'll have one more question. I'll have so many questions for you, but I really want to talk about this idea of representation, because you are Salvadorian, Col Col Colombian, and you know we're talking about underrepresented writers. You're also writing from the gay lens as a gay man, writing about uh, polyamory and things that, like you know, I guess we don't see a lot or enough of in novels. And so I'm curious about how you approach that, how that feels. Um, yeah, I think initially all of these kind of constructed identities uh, weighed on me, like, ooh, I represent all of these things. And, and what happens is that when you are underrepresented in a field like this, then you come along and everyone thinks, oh, that's, that's the experience of everyone in that category. So I always put that pressure on myself a little bit, and then I didn't. I just kind of stopped and I realized that like I, I do rep a lot of these identities and communities, but I'm not trying to say that any of these communities is perfect or that we're a monolith. So I'm very comfortable being just one part of the tapestry and I think about that. And that uh, by talking about the things that I talk about or just kind of being, honestly, just being, um, I don't, make, for example, I don't think being Colombian or Salvadorian too central, but I also don't hide from it, and I think it's important, uh, because I believe that as we start to fill out the proportions that correspond to us, you know, uh, these things will be less interesting to people, right? And we have hundreds of years of the dominant group writing about their experiences and you know, we've gotten to a point where I don't think anyone is gonna ask Jonathan Franzen, is this really about your life, you know? Like, is this really how you live your day? You know, maybe some people do and they wonder it, but I think it's because we know a lot of that about that experience or, it, or we think we do and so we're like, now I wanna know about the adverbs, you know? Tell, tell us about how you constructed that sentence. Tell us about like why you start in the present, go into the past and then circle back to the present. You know, those are interesting questions about craft and form and, um, and less about identity, but we're still going through, I think, some growing pains around giving people the space that they deserve. Does that make sense? No, it does. Okay, good. I mean, I think I asked, too, because for a while, I don't think that we were thinking about it as a tap tapestry. Like, right. the fact that, you know, it was suddenly like, okay, this, this person, because they wrote this book, represents a part of the community, right? right. But no, I think you're writing with a lot of contemporary authors um, that are creating stories and putting it into the Latinx literary canon. Yeah. How does that, how's that felt? How's that been? I mean, it's so many great people that I feel like are, are coming through. Um, it's actually really nice because um, there has been, in a very short period of time, um, a community that's formed of writers and other people in this world. And, Credit to you, Lupita, because I think you promote that and sort of bring us all together and remind us that we are part of, a, a, you know, of a larger community. And uh, I mean, when I say to you, incredibly helpful, it's really, really helpful to have these other writers in my life in every way. People like Angie Cruz, who's just an angel, um, Justin Torres, Clavis Natera, folks who like send me job opportunities and remind me how to do this and tell me how to, you know, how to approach an editor or a public, you know, things like that that I had no idea. It's just sort of swoop in and, and give me advice and will meet me in a bookstore on a Wednesday night in San Francisco, you know, like without knowing me, eh? And so that, that's, that's pretty great, you know, special. It is so special and it's so exciting. Uh, Justin Torres has a brand new book called out, mm. Come Out Blackouts, everybody go read it. Angie Cruz will be here um, October 7th, so please come and join us. Um, she will be here with a group of other people, and I'll tell you a little bit more later. But I do want to leave time for you all to ask questions. Um, don't be shy. If not, I have, I have a ton of questions. I could sit here and talk to you all day, Alejandro. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Like, I can hear myself like double. No, but thank you, Alejandro. I want to. The first one is not a question, but I just want to thank you 
when you share about your anxiety, because I remember when I read your tweet and I was like, oh my God, I feel the same way. And kind of the way that you share it and then you had the interview again, it's kind of, it's going to help me like to talk about it as mm. well mm. and not to be ashamed of it. So yeah. thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I do be, I, I don't really ask questions, but I was like, when I started reading um, the people who report my stress, I really had a question about, about craft and then you started talking about it. Like <laughs> I just read the first page. It's like, oh my God, how do you do this? You know, like it's so cinematographic in so many ways. And it's like, how do you approach in like in the sentence level your editing? That's that's what I wanted to ask you. you know? Oh, yeah. Um, thank you, and thanks for your earlier comment. And remind me, I want to say something about anxiety. Mm -hmm. I'm always a PSA. The I usually don't take notes or outline any of my work, and, and in particular short stories, none of it. What I do is I'll have an idea, and I will sit with it, and then, and the idea could be for a scene, honestly. It could be the opening scene, it could be the middle scene, or it could be a plot point. And then I'll start crafting it over the next few weeks. And I don't give myself too much time. I try to think about it obsessively as I walk through the city, and then I think, okay, this is the character I'm thinking of. And then I start looking at people's faces, because I'm not great with those sorts of descriptions. Sometimes I take pictures, but not too often. And then I'll be like, okay, that's how I would describe that face. This is with the hair, this is how I would describe their, their gait. And then when I feel as if I'm forgetting the very first thing I wanted to write, then I sit down and write. And I try to write that short story in, the first, in two or three days, no more than that. Ideally in one day, because uh, there's something about the momentum that shifts if I wait too long. And forget about it if I take a week off. Mm -hmm. And it's happened, and I have so many half stories. Mm. Just freaking 4,000 words sitting there, and I'm like, I cannot go back to it. I don't know how to pick up the momentum again. So I have to sort of get it out as, as quickly as possible. And that's really just a, a transcription of the mind at that point. It just poof. Then in the next draft, I'm like, okay, let me, uh, this is a little preachy. So I start thinking, that's a little preachy, this is a little this, and then I think, are the sentences beautiful? And every draft after that are like, yeah, well, that's a nice sound, I liked it, okay, I'm doing an okay job. But then I'm like, that one's not pretty. This one's not, no, I don't like that sentence. That could be a, such a, always mindful that you don't want to bombard the reader, you know? I'm not the kind of writer that will spend too much time describing the contours of a leaf that falls into a scene. All power to them, but that's not me. Um, I'm much more interested in the interactions between humans, and, you know, and the leaf can be the backdrop, that's fine. And so, so yeah, so in the subsequent drafts, I'm, yeah, I, I like to think of it as ice, sculpt, ice sculpting, you know? That, so I have this big block, and then I just more and more and more and more. Yeah. I was reading recently that uh, Lauren Groff, you know, she has a new book, Faster Wilds, Florida Stories, Matrix, anyway, that she will write it longhand and then destroy it or, or put it away and then write it again from memory what? because she's like, I will keep, if it's important, I'll, it'll, it'll still be here. If it's haunting enough, it'll still be there, yeah, something like basically, that. right? Yeah, I'm like, damn. <laughs> uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great, cool. Leave someone back there. Did you want to say something about anxiety before we go to the Oh, so yeah. really quickly, I think you're referring, you're referring to- Because I need anxiety too, okay. sorry. <laughs> in, in March of last year, uh, the University of Georgia flew me out because I had published something in the Georgia Review and it was my first flight in seven years. I'm, in, in addition to being afraid of public speaking, I also don't like flying. And so I, right, so I get there, and it's my first event, and it's a symposium, and there aren't many more people than this in the room, and several of us are presenting, and it's, I'm the writer, uh, the fiction writer is a poet, there's a visual artist, there's a photographer, and we're each day, each of us gets a time to present our work. And just before it's my turn, they're like, after the lunch break, Alejandro Varela will be presenting. I mean, full panic. And I thought, okay, you know what? It's fine. I'm gonna break a half Xanax, take it. I would have liked more time for it to get into my, into my blood system, but this is fine. And so like 40 minutes go by and I'm just getting more and more anxious. Like I'm like vibrating and I'm three blocks away from the place 
And so then I broke a beta blocker in half. Okay, I'm also a f like I'm very cognizant of not taking too much. And I talked to my doctor about mixing, and I said, fine, I can do half and half. Great. I'm walking to the venue, and I'm thinking, I need to call them and say that someone in my family died, and I have to go to the I have to go to the airport. I am so sorry. <laughs> you know the funny not the not funny thing is the next day my aunt died, but that's oh, another story. Yeah. It's okay. We knew it was coming, and so I mean it's still sad, but um, so she. I'm getting there and we walk by this bar and it's a college town so there it's a Saturday afternoon and people are just drunk everywhere all these youngsters and I'm going to the little art museum to present and I have to walk by this whiskey bar and I think yeah, forget it I'm just walking in here and I order a, a whiskey neat and I'm looking at this whiskey for a while because I've never mixed all of these things before so now I'm a little worried that this is gonna blow up in my face but it's either this or go to the airport at this point I'm so, so freaking anxious. So I take the shot, and I get to the place, and I'm like a little bit like, all right, this will be fine. I just have to read, and I'll talk for a little bit. And you know what? I let the train leave the station. I didn't take care of it soon enough is what I learned, this, the management of this. And I have my anxiety um, comes from PTSD. I, I worked a block from the World Trade Center on 9-11. So there's a whole thing about being trapped in a building. Was, it's okay. Don't feel bad. I'm over it. But... It's, it was still sort of there and present, and so when it's, they're about to announce me, it's as if the panic restarted. Nothing worked. And so I was like, I just picked up the mic, and I said to the room, just as the organizer is coming to introduce me, and I said, okay, I have to tell you something. I'm freaking out. On 9-11, I was trapped in a building for several hours, and I have PTSD, and although I'm not trapped right now, I feel as if I'm trapped in my brain and I got on a plane for the first time in seven years yesterday, and blah, blah, blah. We're gonna be okay, but I just wanted you to know. And the crowd thought I was doing performance art. <laughs> so at first, people are like, oh. and I can see people reading their programs because they were like, he's not the artist, like, what is he doing? And so I'm like, I'm not kidding. And I said, does anyone here deal with anxiety? And like, hands started to go up, and then people started nodding. And then I could feel the energy in the room change, so I sat down. And then Gerald, God, God bless him, Gerald Ma, the editor of the Georgia Review, came up, he sort of looked at me, and then read the longest intro that has ever been read about my work. <laughs> and I just drank like a bottle of water, watched out of the corner of my eyes, and I, I felt like in that moment, I forced community that didn't realize I was forcing it. And I was like, everyone here knows. Like, I've dispelled this, 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 like, the, the, the myth, the secrecy around it. And then I killed. It was fine. It was great. But, but yeah, I, I mean, that was a pretty extreme example. But it's gotten much better ever since. There have been a few close calls, but I've managed to make my way through. Okay, sorry, question back there. Yeah, now I'm a little worried about triggering panic. No, 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 no. I'm not there. I'm not. I'm. I'm promise you. I'm fine. You had said um, pressure is privilege. Yeah. Um, and you had um, the first two manuscripts were complete manuscripts, which means you were walking through the city and you were walk writing this, and it came out. Now that you have to write something because you said you're going to write it, yeah. how has that changed your relationship with writing, or has it changed? Uh, I'm great with deadlines, and I'm a fast writer. Uh, but it is a little bit kind of like, oh gosh, now it's it it's not it's not coming from me. It's kind of being pulled from me, you know. And I liked I like the sort of underdog thing that was happening for me earlier in this career. Now it feels kind of like, well, there are some expectations. The good news is I finished book number three. Uh, but it's not, the bad news is, it's not the book that they bought. So they, I'm still working on it, and I'm going to send it to them. I think it'll be okay. I'm not too, too worried. But, um, yeah, I'm kind of in a place right now where I'm like, you don't accidentally write two books, and they don't accidentally get received pretty well. So there's something here, and I just have to kind of keep going. Yeah, thank you for your question. And you did not trigger any panic. Hi. Um, I have a question, kind of off of the representation question from earlier, but I feel like 
you know, the authentic voice is what a lot of people are searching for. And something I really enjoyed about Town of Babylon is that you find these mundane or like really simply stated moments. And I feel like that creates like the cinematography of like describing things that we all know to be true about like the suburbs or schizophrenia and racism or like class and race and things like that. And so I just, I think I'm curious about, I wrote it down, <laughs> <laughs> how you balance kind of being authoritative and I think quote unquote authentic with like the wider idea of like diaspora writing today and kind of having to represent all these different cultures and viewpoints and perspectives without being cheesy or right. exaggerated, you know, especially in light of the Hasan Minaj stuff that recently came yeah. out and everything like that. Uh, thank you for your question uh, and for reading Babylon. I would say that I am an authority on my experience in this world. And I can extract, and I'm also a good observer, right? I feel good, I feel confident that I observe and can extrapolate from my experience others. And I can add and multiply, so I can see that uh, uh, someone else has it worse than me, so I can empathize up to a point, and I'm like, mm, you know, times three for them, or half for them, right? And so I kind of look at it that way a little bit, and then try to use that empathy across all of the protagonists. Um, I don't, oh, and you said the other thing is, oh, I also do a lot of uh, sort of, I try to have my narrators and my characters grow in the book because they can be so authoritative about things and at times off-putting, I promise you it's on purpose, is that my hope is that their arcs in the books are to, um, they're also a way for to reflect on the reader and their own experience, to be like, oh look, this person is willing to admit that they are completely wrong about this experience or this viewpoint and my hope is that, like, in that way, they're like, okay, that's 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 a one way to look at humanity, and he's not fully right, but I've thought that way too before, something like that. So I'm not afraid for the characters to be wrong. In fact, I think it's really important for the protagonist to undercut his authority with error, and for it to be obvious to the reader. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. If not, we can talk more after. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, my name is Francisco. I'm one of those nerds who came out here because of your background in public health. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've been working on this lit, um, theory of social determinants of health as literary criticism. Nice. Um, but um, you know, the social scientist in me, the economist in me, has brought up questions of class, and I'm constantly curious about how characters navigate relations with others and in their interior lives based on class. Um, Two-fold question. One is, uh, in your stories, could you maybe cite an example or discuss how um, characters' notion of class or even class jumping influences their anxiety or even circumscribes their relationship to other characters? And then the other question is, um, this is for you as public health. Right. Um, what are, where do you want to see other authors exploring this idea of class affecting the interior lives or even a capitalist system affecting the interior lives of characters, um, whether in your future work or what other authors may want to explore? Right. Thanks. So the first question was class as, Francisco, wait one second. What was it? The first question was... Um, Right, okay, right. So this, uh, I, right. So my work is absolutely about class jumping, and what I mean by that is you're, you start at one place on the ladder and you end up in another, and it's, it's quite an adjustment. We can talk about all the benefits of being upper middle class if you started in poverty, but it doesn't, it's not like there aren't some drawbacks, and I think a lot of those can be psychological. The difference is that you can afford a massage, right, and to deal with it, and you can afford the vacation, and so these buffers, and coping mechanisms actually are the things that, 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 that lead to those extra months on the end of your life expectancy. Um, the problem is that to succeed, you leave people behind. I, generally speaking, I'm sure you can cite examples of when that doesn't happen, but 
it absolutely does if the, the goal is for you to accumulate more resources and have more wealth. By definition, you are sacrificing something, time with your family, with your community, with the people you grew up with, because you don't all make it out. So, so you leave someone behind, and then what are those relationships like afterward? And is there still the same type of trust, right? If you all start out in the same place, you and your, everyone on your block, and you're the only person who has a 401k and a savings account and a nice car and a house, and then you come back to visit, and half your family wants to borrow money from you, or they need it, and it's not just about like, Ugh, but it, that changes your relationship. Those, those are changes, and, and so there are many different ways. That's, that's just one. I don't, please don't want to make that about that. Um, because it is also feels often like a privilege, I believe, to be able to be there for the people that you care about. So I'm not dinging that. I'm just saying that like the, the class jumping pulls apart communities because you, not everyone can be the CEO. And if you keep climbing, you're eventually going to leave someone below or behind. And I don't think you can have a, a really full and complete life if if you don't have community with you. And the thing is, where you land isn't always all that great to begin with. I mean, yes, you have the buffers. I'm, I, I want everyone to be, you know, to make enough to live with dignity and be happy all the time. But like, especially I think when you are uh, a minority and you kind of jump, suddenly you're like completely out of your element. And so now you don't even fully feel like you fit in where you landed, where you were striving to get to that whole time. But my characters kind of reflect in some ways my experience. You know, if Babylon is a book about not being able to go home, and that protagonist was raised in the suburbs, and he fled his community because his parents thought safety, success, mortgage, you know, these are the things that we have to aspire to do, but you completely sacrifice your community and end up being the only one of your kind on the block or in the entire neighborhood. And so, um, if that book is about not being able to go back to where you came from, this, this collection is about all the anxieties and discomforts about where you landed. And, uh, but it really isn't like that the problem is that the now wealthy or more comfortable person is dealing with anxiety. It's about everyone else and, and what that means. And just to kind of say, I call bull on the American dream. Um, what do I want other writers to do? If I had won the National Book Award, I had a speech. You should have won it. Yeah, no, 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 we love everyone. Um, if I had won it, I had this idea that I would w probably the only time in my life have the ear of everyone in the publishing industry because that room is just full of everyone. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we looked at the five upstream policies that could change the health of the United States? And wh what could they be? Okay, so a National Health Service, reparations, land back, um, a $35 minimum wage pegged to inflation, and I can't remember the fifth one. But let's say that we all agreed that we could show that this would improve the health of everyone in society, and we woke up tomorrow. I thought I was gonna ask everyone in the room that in the next year or two, whatever project they work on, if we could pick one of those. Let's say the $35 minimum wage, and we all dropped it into our work. It could be a plot point, it could be the thing that the tertiary character says in a moment of, like, you know, craziness, and you read it once and move on. It could be on the headline of a newspaper. It could be in the acknowledgments, you know, whoever. I thought the collective weight of every single writing project to come in the next five years, just suggesting that the minimum wage could be 36, actually should be $36 an hour. That might do a lot more to move our consciousness around this idea, right? And so, and then the next year we could do reparations. And the following, so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that I, I, I would love for writing, in particular fiction, to, take, to be a little bit more political. I mean, the world really is on fire. I think we all have to be doing something. It can't all be pretty. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like we have time for one more question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I, you got, you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Hola, Alejandro. Hola. So you talked about the tapestry and representing a little bit yeah. of what you're comfortable representing. Yeah. Now, I'm all about freedom, I'm an educator. So yeah. how has the tapestry that your characters created, that you created through your characters, how has that brought you freedom? 
the tapestry that I've created, how it's brought me freedom? Through your characters. Oh. Hmm. That's such a good question. Um, my cholesterol went down 75 points <laughs> the year after I finished writing the book. I did not change my diet. I did not run any. I run and I already avoid dairy and, and I try not to eat too much meat. And I had high cholesterol for about 12 years. And I believe that I went through kind of a moment where I accomplished something and I felt really good about myself. And that outweighed all of the other insecurities and doubts that I was kind of carrying around with me for a long time. I cannot figure out, I've talked to my doctor, I, as you might imagine, I map, I get a physical every year, I keep track of like all of my folate, my folic acid, my, all of it. And we could not bring my cholesterol down. And he was like, maybe we should try Lipitor. And I'm like, I'm not going there yet. Give me a minute. Because it's never like egregiously terrible, right? But it's just above. And then when I went to get the test, I was like, 76 points. Are you kidding me? This is unheard of. And then I got, I said, let's do it again in like four months because I want to make sure I didn't do something and the same. And so I have my physical coming up in a few weeks and I'm, I'm hoping I kept it. I can't think of what else it was. I mean, we know for sure that cortisol has an effect on cholesterol. So I wonder if without even realizing it, I was kind of holding my head up higher after this success, which I guess begs the question, why should success do that? But I really was about this feeling of like, wow, okay, I can stand on my own two feet. This is good. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I like how you circled it back to health. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, welcome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Alejandro. This has been such a treat. And uh, thank you again to DCPL, the public foundation, the DCP Public Foundation, for all the hard work you all are doing to make this series and so many yes, more programs thank possible. Thank you. Yeah. And we have uh, an event, our next event, October th um, the seventh. Oh, I'm so excited about this one. Yes, at three p.m. Angie Cruz will be here, Lillian Rivera will be here, Caro de Robertis will be here, and Jakira Diaz will be here. We'll be chatting about all things community and their wonderful books. Um, so please come back and join us. Um, it's gonna be a blast. My brother, my little brother, um, I had him come and he's gonna do a little vinyl curation DJing for us. Nice. So, uh, you know, doors open at 2.30 is what we're saying. Seating opens at 2.30, so come join. Um, and thank you so much for being here and for hanging out with us. Also, um, yes, thank you, Lupita. You're amazing. Thank you to the Public Library um, and Loyalty Books. And I think I will be, I can sign books, right? Yes. I'll be here. And I don't want to use my anxiety as a, if I, some, I, sometimes I get a little anxious when all the books don't sell. So <laughs> I did it, Loyalty. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Alejandro will be signing, and feel free to, both copies of his books are available, so Christmas is coming up. Let's do the thing. <laughs>